Hi everybody, my name is Hannah and this is Pepper and Pine and today I'm sharing with you a review of the live education Waldorf curriculum for year four. I also have a couple of additional resources to help you when you're presenting your math main lesson block. And there are a couple of books that are recommended within the curriculum, but for this video, I am not sharing all of the additional resources that we have used in the past for our grade four curriculum. So we're going to dive right in. And I, I have like some wonderful resources for math. But I'm going to set those aside just for a moment so that we can dive into the curriculum. So Waldorf curriculum does use the main lesson book approach or main lesson block approach. And for year four, you're going to have imagination math with fractions, local geography, history, and industry, teaching grammar with imagination. There are two books for the man and animal unit. One has the main lesson block and then the other one has additional stories for that unit. You have drawing simple animal forms, which will come in handy with your block on man and animal, which is somewhat of a zoology block, but it is different. And then you have your introduction to the fourth year, which is really important because this is going to set the stage for how to do your main lesson blocks, your block rotation, all about your child um, in the fourth grade year, what developmental stages your child is going through. And so this one is especially important. All right, so let's move all of these beautiful wooden fraction resources aside for a moment so that we can dive into our curriculum. So the introduction to the fourth year, and also I might add that in general, um, and with most Waldorf approaches, although you may find some differences here and there, a school starts at seven. So as long as your child is seven in that first grade year, so that your child might be six and then turning seven, um, you're, th that's like grade one versus in other schools, you might be six like for grade one and five for grade uh, kindergarten. And then you might be turning that age at the end of the school year. With the Waldorf curriculum, it's in my opinion, about a year behind traditional or conventional school. And I've always done it about a year behind uh, traditional school. So we started formal education at age seven, which would be grade one for us. Okay, so the fourth grade year is going to go through the different main lesson blocks that are included in the curriculum. And also, we've been doing this approach for about 20 years now and we've purchased the majority of our curriculum from live education 15 to 20 years ago maybe 12 to 20 years ago approximately um so there may have been and actually they there have been revisions in the curriculum since then and some of the curriculum that i have is not the revised curriculum so do check their website for updated revised main lesson blocks as well as updated prices some main some years include other or additional main lesson blocks and over the course of these 20 years and and even more because they've been in business for for even more than 20 years, uh, there have been revisions to every grade level over time. So I am sharing with you the ones that we've had for many years. So there are probably most definitely going to be some differences and maybe even major differences with the curriculum currently as it is right now. Okay, so the for introduction to the fourth year, and I have to say that oftentimes I would skip over the introduction and just dive straight into the curriculum, but I encourage you as best as you can to go through the introduction first, especially if you're not familiar with the Waldorf approach, because it's going to set the stage for what to expect for that year, how to do your block rotations, even the concept of a main lesson block, which may be uh, something new to you if you haven't explored the Waldorf approach before. It's also going to give you a suggestion of additional books that you need or are encouraged to get in order to complement the um, the different main lesson blocks. And I just remembered that there is a main lesson block for the Norse mythology, and I 
cannot remember whether I lent that out or I have lost it, but I forgot to mention that that one is also included. It just, when I saw for the Norse mythology block, um, I just remember that that was also included in year four. And so I don't know if I never had it. I lent it out. Actually, I must have had it since this, this book is included um, or it's written here. So I have lost it over the years um, and I, I, I don't have it to share with you today. So I apologize for that. Even though we have done those units and I do have main lesson books with my children's work for Norse mythology, I don't have it at the moment. Okay, how to organize your year teaching using the block rotation. So a lot of times with the Waldorf approach, you will do a main lesson block for about three weeks, maybe four weeks. If it's longer than that, it's recommended that you break it up over two main lesson blocks separated by a different one in between those two main lesson blocks. A main lesson block is basically a concentration of a subject area for a period of time versus a unit study, which would try to include other subject areas into that study. A main lesson block block is also very specific for the grade level for the developmental stage of this of the child of the student and they usually the lessons are about an hour and a half to two hours long which is usually longer than most lessons and other methodologies and philosophies and definitely longer in most part to a conventional traditional lesson that you would have like in a public or a private school there are some schools that do a block schedule rotation so their classes are a little bit longer but for the majority of of um, educational approaches for the for the classes they're usually about 55 minutes or so long so the main lesson is going to be an hour and a half to two hours long but it's not just the one lesson in a main lesson block you're doing your opening activities which could include some mental math um, in our homeschool it might include like some games that we might play and if we're doing a math main lesson block We'll try to include some math games or some mental math, but we will also do mental math and math games throughout the year with other main lesson blocks as well. You might include like what we did, we, we might have like a picture book and that's not a Waldorf approach, but those are some of the things that I might include in our opening activities as well. If you're working on some poetry or your musical instrument, you might include that as well. And if you are homeschooling and you don't have access to a Eurythmy teacher, you might include some of your Eurythmy in your opening activities, or you might reserve it for a special period of time uh, later on in the day but if you were just doing a few movements in your opening activities you might choose to do some things that coordinated with the grade level my children really loved uh, any kind of active math if we threw a bean bag back and forth between us and we would recite say math facts or skip counting or the multiplication tables that was a lot of fun uh, it was especially more engaging and and my my boys really loved it a lot and that was something that they you know was just a lot of fun and really great to review those kinds of math facts so you would do your opening activities it could last 15 minutes uh, approximately for us our opening activities oftentimes lasted far longer and we would really get into like the books that we were reading or the games that we were playing and it could take up to an hour at, at times and and that's not intended to be that long then you would do um, your main lesson and your lesson includes several parts it includes the actual lesson presentation which comes at the end it includes your lesson activities which um, is maybe also not the first thing that you do and it includes your review which usually is the first thing that you'll do that could be like an oral review of the previous day's lessons and then you might have like some written work and some drawings that go in your main lesson book uh, and then you might do like a hands-on activity in the form of a lesson activity um, that might also be something that you're just doing at your desk as part of your lesson and you'll close with your new lesson the new lesson content the story portion of your lesson oftentimes is what ends the lesson not always there could be a math lesson that doesn't quite follow that format okay then uh the the introduction to the fourth year is going to explain the different main lesson blocks and how long they last so you you'll see that there are either three weeks or six weeks but then on the flip page you're going to see that all of the main lesson blocks are broken up into three week main lesson blocks even though for instance the human and animals like the zoology unit has six weeks but you're actually going to split it up into block one and block two and you're going to separate it over time
Now, this is the suggested main lesson block rotation. I don't usually follow what's suggested, and I'm not sure if the suggested main lesson block rotation is part of the Waldorf philosophy, or it's just included here as a suggestion by this particular curriculum and this by live education. I tend to do our head work in the fall that would include like our new math learning and our new grammar learning and oftentimes it might include a science block that didn't get completed the previous year and we're opening up the school year with that leftover science block as well as our math block so for me those tend to be like the head uh, um, head work uh, ones that require maybe more space for that new learning to get absor absorbed and when it's the the beginning of the school year i sometimes think that the children have a little bit more capacity for that new learning they're not fatigued from the school year yet they're kind of fresh from the summer and we do take our summers off entirely we don't do any new learning or any review learning in the summer at all it's just fun summer activities and fun times we put our learning completely aside it's it's really important for that to that learning to get processed and digested and and rest before it's revisited later on uh, and that could be later on like a brand new school year so after the fall like, and after the that, that head work we move into our history units and we'll do the history units in the winter for us it's a time to like kind of cozy up and do a lot of reading we're in southern california so there's not much cozying up but we do have a few cold days and a couple of rainy days as well but for the most part uh we'll spend that time and of course we're in the northern hemisphere this you know obviously would change where you're at and depending on when you're schooling and what location you're living in if you if you have more extreme uh weather seasonal weather changes or it's more moderate um, however you decide to do it this is something that I learned many years ago from a completely different uh, lecture someone who wasn't practicing the Waldorf approach and it really kind of spoke to me kind of schooling through the seasons and, and that's what we ended up doing and so we'll do a lot more of our writing and our reading and our history in the winter time and this is not exclusive but this is just kind of my approach we are still doing daily work daily and that will include math and so once we learn the new content at the beginning of the year we are reviewing that throughout the year and not perfectly but that's my idea that's my that's my aim is to do the new math learning and then we have lots of time to review it and study it and perfect it or master it as we go on throughout the school year then in the springtime we'll do our science main lesson blocks and that's a time that we'll spend more time outdoors we'll be you know doing our garden our nature walks just more movement activities and so that's uh that i reserve for the springtime okay so again, the, the curriculum is going to go through the main lesson block approach, like, you know, with your opening activities, review the lesson presentation. It's going to include some ideas for your opening activities. So here they've suggested like some movement or rhythmic math, mental math, verses and poetry. Um, that's a great time to review any songs or poetry or verses that you're memorizing and then any musical instrument that you're practicing and then it includes here five minute form drawings i completely forgot about form drawings and how important they are in the in the education and they're primarily done when the children are a little bit on the younger side so grade one two and three but including them throughout all of the grades is wonderful because they do get more intricate and more involved and they do have a place in the curriculum then it goes into like the review time, the lesson presentation, lesson activity. It also goes into uh, materials needed for homeschooling the 10 to 12 year old student. So what I really like about this curriculum is it gives you like a, a, a t um, sorry, an age span for the curriculum. So it's not just for 10 year olds. It could be for 10 year olds, 11 year olds, 12 year olds, anytime in this block, you could do the fourth grade curriculum. And again, for the fifth grade curriculum, it gives around the same time, uh, frame you know the 10 to 12 year olds you wouldn't want to do this with a nine-year-old for instance the nine-year-old really will benefit from the grade three curriculum and, and all of the stories that are provided there uh, so then so some of the things that you might need are your lesson books for sure um, i still use the blank pages even though i have a middle schooler but you could have the line pages you might need some graph paper um, a chalkboard is nice to have but not necessary 
color pencils and other art supplies are definitely something that you want to make space for in your budget. And then um, pencils, ruler, and a fountain pen. I didn't use fountain pens in grade four. Maybe I did a little bit, but I tend to save those until grade five in, in my experience. But you can choose to do this at grade four. I wouldn't choose younger than grade four. And definitely as they move into middle school, you want them working with um, a pen or a fountain pen if possible. So other art supplies that you might choose to have on hand, potter's clay. Clay is really great for uh, working for, to make models of all different kinds of things that you might you that you might be doing for your your lessons. But it's also a really great tactile product that children really the, the engagement with clay is really wonderful to see, and it really helps certain students. If clay is a little bit too messy for you, then I would suggest beeswax. And also don't forget that children this age still love to bake with you in the kitchen. And if you're making dough for bread, they're going to love to work with that as well. Uh, watercolor, paper, watercolors, um, the brushes that go along with water for watercoloring is definitely something that you're going to want to have on hand. And if you've been homeschooling with the Waldorf Approach since grade one, you'll probably already have those materials. You might just need to replenish your supplies a little bit. What I love is that it's also going to include some some aspects about the fourth year student. This part is golden to understand the development and how the curriculum is going to support that development. Okay, let's move on to the different main lesson blocks. And I apologize for not having the Norse mythology to share with you today. Um, but you can definitely see that on the website at Live Education. So drawing simple animal forms, this is going to give you the techniques and the skills to learn these different forms so that when you are doing the drawings for the main lesson block on man and animal, you will have been prepared with these um, techniques. I It's been a while since we did this main lesson block and I can't remember if these were techniques that I also taught the child or if this particular book was intended just for the, the the teacher to learn these um these skills and then when you are doing that main lesson block then you are forming the drawings based on these principles rather than doing this separately i, I do believe this went along with the zoology unit or once you learn how to draw these animals because there's a very specific way that you will draw different images from the time the child is in grade one all the way through grade eight, there's a um, value in starting in the center and moving outward rather than doing an outline and then coloring it in. So there are different reasons why you would do this kind of illustration for the grade four student. Okay, so then you have your main lesson block on man and animal. And so what this one, it has the main lesson block itself, but it's not going to have a lot of the content that goes along with each of the lessons. It has some, but the content for each of the lessons you're going to find in here. So it's going to have information on each of the animals that, uh, each animal that's presented in the man and animal main lesson block. And this one is quite extensive. It, it, it Even though it says six weeks, I, I remember this taking much longer for us. Teaching grammar with imagination. This is uh, so grammar and writing, it, and literature and storytelling, or I'm sorry, creative writing. That's done. These different main lesson blocks in language arts, they're done every year. But every year there seems to be like a, a slightly different approach. You're doing your writing every day in your main lesson block. Except math maybe doesn't have quite the same kind of writing that you would have in your other main lesson blocks. But you're doing your writing almost daily. And what I love about the um, the way that you are going to include your writing in your, um, in your lessons is that for, for this, for grade four, it's going to be incorporated into the other lessons in a way. So if you're, if you're learning, say, um, if you're learning adverbs for the first time, then those adverbs and the, the, the sentences you're doing with those adverbs, they may coordinate with your zoology block. Now, something that I've done with the grammar block, and I, I can't remember if this was inspired by the Waldorf curriculum or just I was inspired by colors themselves, so I can't actually remember. But when we were, oh, also 
I want to say that I do love sentence diagramming and I can't remember if it's included in this curriculum, but I used a lot of the Susan Weisbauer grammar and language arts curriculum in addition to the Waldorf curriculum. And those two approaches are very, very different. But I did really like the grammar and the writing with ease curriculum by Susan Weisbauer. And there was a lot of sentence diagramming in that curriculum. And there was also copy work and dictation. And we used that extensively in our homeschool. And when we would do our sentence diagramming, I would have my students do the verb and adverb, adjective and um nouns in different colors and so when they were doing the subject and the predicate and then you know doing the rest of the sentence diagramming i would have them do it in colors that for me coordinated with the different parts of speech so for me nouns i we would do them in blue because blue is a bit more of a sedentary calm uh color and nouns are sedentary versus verbs or movement for the most part and so i did them in red Obviously, there are nuances with all of the parts of speech. And then adjectives we did in purple because they modify nouns. And then adverbs modify verbs. So we did them in orange. And this was just a personal preference that, that I did. So you'll see that, that this curriculum for the grammar, this is the information that you will learn and then present. This isn't a workbook for the students. This isn't something that they are reading. This is your teaching manual so that you can present the lessons. Local geography, history, and industry. This one is going to be something that you are going to have to bring your own resources to in addition to the main lesson book itself because your local history is going to be different depending on where you live. But some of the things that you're going to find regardless of where you are based on the curriculum is you're going to have maps, you're going to have um, map, ma map making is really big. There was something else in uh, the curriculum. Oh, uh, just the local geography. So that's going to be something that you're going to want to include. I do want to read to you a couple of things from the curriculum. Getting started with a fourth year student for local geography, history, and industry. The overall gesture of geographical studies through the years moves from the realm of natural resources and the resulting economic life into the cultural sphere and finally into the legal and political realm. So you can see that there is an arc for how you are studying local geography, history, and industry. I also want to read to you this aspect here. The study of cultural geography enters into customs, way of life, rituals, festivals, belief systems, food and clothing, ideals, arts, crafts, etc. of the many people of the world. And what I love about the Waldorf curriculum is that it understands that some of those those aspects, like say the cultural uh, aspects of, of a people and their belief, that's so important to do at a very young age versus... Finally, the legal political ge uh, political geography, the sphere of human rights and the prevailing laws and legal system legal systems that integrate with political geographical boundaries, trade agreements among states and countries, regulations on a federal and state level, as well as international law is best saved for the mature high school student. So you can see that there is a time and place for all the aspects, but that the, the legality and the human rights and um, political aspects, that's saved for later on. And of course, if you choose to do more humanitarian and um, civil rights type of lessons at a younger age, you absolutely can. But there is this arc of doing the culture and the crafts and the um, beliefs, clothing, food, ge ge uh, geography of a people, and then moving it into the legal and the political later on. So I just wanted to mention that as well. And then there are some illustrations uh, available in the book, but you will probably be drawing on other resources since the local history and geography is going to be unique for your area. Okay, finally, we have imaginative math and fractions. And I do want to say that in all of my years of homeschooling, I've only been able to do half of this main lesson block. When it gets to the more imaginative part, I have to tell you that I had a really hard time wrapping my head around it. So I wanted to say that I, for me, I'm more of a math and science person. My degree was in chemistry. I did really well in math when I moved to this country. Um, I was born in France, went to Waldorf school there then moved to the United States when I was about eight 
I didn't do so well in language arts. Um, th though I knew English at a young age, I was more familiar with familiar with French when I moved here. I was in ESL for a little bit. I uh, still spoke English at home. I was totally fine with English, but I was learning lessons in French when I was in school. Um, then went into, um, uh, you know, ESL, learn, learned fine. It was all great. Forgot most of my French. That's <laughs> too bad. But what I wanted to say regarding teaching imaginative math is that I am more of a math person. And so that makes me actually a really terrible math teacher because I assume things are just going to come easy. And I, and why am I doing so much explanation? So I just want to put that out there that I'm a much better language arts teacher because language arts was so much more difficult for me to master that I am a lot more patient and compassionate towards my students for the most part. I mean, there are times that I wasn't so much that way. Um, a lot of times I should say that I was, that I would get impatient with my students as they got older and I expected them to know things, but I was less, um, um, patient with math because I, I just assumed that they would know and why is it so difficult so when we got into the imaginative part of fractions math I completely just overlooked it entirely I I could not process it that way but I did just fine with the more um I don't know the more analytical part of math and so in in doing this and honestly if if you didn't do this in fourth grade and you save fractions for fifth grade totally fine the the longer i waited for some of these concepts the easier it was for my children to understand them because we were able to live this math longer before we put it down on paper so if you're introducing fractions in fourth grade or fifth grade you want to be living fractions for years before you actually put it down on paper and if you haven't then in fourth grade definitely start doing those living math you know cooking or just speaking in math terms you know um just have half the cookie or give a third of those um cheerios to your brother you know those kinds of math concepts so that the terminology is familiar and the concepts are familiar and then when you put it down on paper and you actually do the math associated to it like say the four mathematical operations addition subtraction multiplication division that you're going to do with your fractions at least the foundation is already familiar Okay, so let me show you a few of the math resources that we have. Now, because math, or I'm sorry, because fractions are being introduced in grade four, these resources are probably going to be more used in grade five. That's my approach, my opinion, but you certainly could use them in grade four. The first things I want to show you are some math workbooks. Now, the fractions, the key two fractions, decimals, and percents, that are that i i learned about the this particular program in the grade five curriculum for live education actually because by that point when you're starting your geometry you can use these workbooks to perfect your fractions review them and just make sure that you understand all the concepts related to them i wouldn't necessarily use this as an introduction to fractions if your child was in fourth grade unless your child was very familiar and and, and fractions came very easy to them then you might consider having these workbooks um i would just use them a little bit later it you you may choose to do them earlier if you wish i found that it was better for me to introduce the whole concept and do the writing like you know put it down on paper and then revisit it the following year with all of the the math that goes with it i really really love this curriculum i hope that it's still available uh because you know we we, we purchased this in abundance many many years ago uh, what i like about it is that it is very easy to use it has great examples and uh it, what do you call it um like it explains the concept <laughs> sorry it explains the concept really well so that a student, if they had some familiarity with fractions, could easily work through these lessons on their own. And that's the way I intended to use them, is that my students could do this as their independent daily work or even part of their opening activities. If, you know, our opening activities lasted an hour, then this would be something that they would do at that time. If you want to include it in this year in grade four i would suggest just doing the four books of fractions and saving percents and decimals for the following year if you wanted a workbook to go with this year 
and you want to save this for the following year, then I would suggest key to measurement and key to metric measurement. The only problem is that at some point in this curriculum, you do need to know fractions. And so this might be something that you use for part of the year, then you move on to fractions and then come back, or you talk about fractions enough that they can do the workbook with the fraction questions that come up later on in the book. But I really like this as a workbook for grade four. Uh, just because it's, again, pretty easy and self-explanatory, and I think the grade four student could master this pretty easily. We have a couple of really beautiful wooden uh, manipulatives and, and um, aids for, for math, like just different things that can help you in your math facts and uh, your mastery of the 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 math facts for this this grade um but i i have also like the the fra i'm sorry the multiplication table here so we have the fractions and the multiplication table and the multiplication table is probably something that was already intro introduced in the previous years but may not have been mastered at this point and i noticed that with my children that mastery came like it would take like literally years to master the math multiplication table because they might learn it be introduced to it one year maybe they're proficient in it the following year maybe they forget and they're not so fast with it and mastery is like you, you know you could do any of them very quickly and you're not hesitating and that's for me that's mastery and that would that takes a little bit of time so i have this this came later in our homeschool years i wish i had it when the kids were very young but i have to say that i'm very impressed with the quality and the variety of the materials that are available now versus when we first started homeschooling so for these little blocks and i love that they're color coded it brings me a lot of happiness you'll have the question on one side the answer on the other side because answers you might have 48 and that's the answer to you know multiple math problems but I love just putting all of these into a basket and then pulling them out and whether we pull out the answer or the question we will ask it to one another and then the other person will answer it and if suppose it's the number 48 and I say six times eight and the answer was um four times 12 for instance and the answer on the back of it was maybe four times 12 it, you know it, it didn't matter because we, we got one uh, you, you know there's, there's many ways to get to 48 for instance um there are of course other numbers that are like that um you know you could do six or 12 or whatnot the point is is that this was a really fun activity that we could incorporate into our opening activities which reviews the math from the previous year because once you once you do a math concept you're going to be revisiting it revisiting it over and over and over again until you achieve mastery so that's why i've included this with the fourth grade curriculum because this is something that we would use from you know third grade to eighth grade to be honest because we were well maybe not eighth grade maybe sixth grade um, because we were constantly revisiting well we, you have to when you get to algebra a lot of it ha has to do with fractions and multiplication table so this one has uh the fractions and the decimals so fractions and decimals one on each side and then it gets uh, and it's color coded which i love and then it goes from uh larger to smaller fractions and all of them equal one which is really i like the visual and so again this this would be a great thing to have on hand to introduce the concepts and then later you could turn this into a game i like turning most things into a game so if you if you're doing the fraction side and you say one fifth and you're like well you know what decimal is that and then they could uh, tell you the decimal and then you could just hold on to the pieces that you get in the end you can tally them up and see who wins so that's another item that we used in our homeschool not as much as the multiplication uh this game or rather these little tiles we use this far more than the fractions something else that we really love is the 24 game there are several in this series i think we own maybe six of them um, from addition and to multiplication to integers and fractions so this one would be just right for this age this this is the one with just multiplications i would not use the fraction one yet that one is really hard i would save that for middle school but this one would be a great game to review your multiplication facts and multiplication table and it's 
I love including games whenever possible. This we could include in our opening activities and, you know, maybe choose like say five or ten cards and just play that many cards. And there are different levels. So this is the one for eight and up. There are ones for six and up and ten and up and etc. So you can choose the one that most suits your child. And if you didn't have this when the children were younger, and you wanted to include this now, this would be for, again, multiplication. So you would be doing, like, say, your, th your uh, skip counting by three for your th three multiplication tables. So you get three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, and then 30. So you can see that you've made a star with, like, all of them. Versus if you do, like, say the four timetable you four eight twelve um sorry four eight twelve sixteen twenty so then you can see the five pointed star and these are just these are just a lot of fun to see a visual representation of the multiplication table so again adding some multiplication review while you're moving into your fractions it's been a few weeks since I recorded the first portion of this video and in that time I reached out to the live education team to see if they would be willing to send me the main lesson blocks that I was missing. The one that I thought that I had, um, the Norse mythology, they sent me a replacement and then they also sent me the two new ones that were not a part of the set as far as I remember when I purchased this curriculum over a decade ago. Let's start with the Norse Smith main lesson book. I already spied some really gorgeous illustrations in here. I also want to say that this curriculum is printed to order, so they don't have a stock lying around. So if there are changes to the curriculum that have been made since I purchased the curriculum, they can be made on the spot before a new printing is made since they are printed to order. I just want to point out that the illustrations or the color in this particular main lesson book is phenomenal. It's so rich and vibrant and beautiful. Now in the past, and the printing might be different, um, you don't want to spill anything on your uh, main lesson book or get water on it. Um, the colors will bleed. At least they used to in my old main lesson books. I'm not sure about that now, but do uh, be careful with your um, with your books. So I also want to share that it also includes some other images in here and you'll find a few of these that are here for inspiration. I These are probably not ones that the children or you would be drawing. If you did, you would be making um, a simpler version of these illustrations, sort of like the ones that you can see in here. Th this is more appropriate for the grade four student and the colors are lovely. It looks like it's a watercolor medium and that just works really well for this unit. You can also see that there are other images that are included as well as this stunning watercolor right here. And this is laid out pretty similarly to some of the other main lesson blocks where you're going to have at the beginning some information on additional resources. Also, I like that the main lesson blocks, and sometimes you'll find this in the introduction for that year, we'll talk about what's going on with the child at that particular age development and why these stories are chosen for that particular age development, um, for what the changes that are going on with the child and the reason behind these um the collection of stories it's going to go into some other details as well and i do encourage you to check out some other books on child development as well as uh, the waldorf methodology of teaching because on occasion quite often to be honest i will include other resources and other teaching methods that really diminish the approach of the waldorf education and there are some very specific things that are intentionally held back when going over uh, the education for that child at that particular grade, that grade level, because the child is not ready for that information developmentally. So you're not holding back because academically they're not ready. You're holding back because developmentally it's not going to land well for them. And when you have such precious little time with your children and the, the time that you have teaching, it's for me, it's personally important that I use that time with things that are going to end up 
being the best use of my time and land well with my children and resonate with them and hopefully be something that's that's good for them academically and developmentally. Uh, so also the way that these main lesson blocks are are worked out is that the main lessons are typically an hour and a half to two hours long. And so while a lot of the stories are included in here, you are recommended to pre-read the, the stories that are in here to present as part of your main lesson, which will be only one portion of several portions in a main lesson block. Typically, I will do the new lesson at the end of the main lesson so that we're doing all of our work first and then more of the passive, and this is for history primarily, uh, more of the passive receptive part of the lesson is happening at the end after they've put in a lot of work to do their drawing, to do their writing for previous lessons, to do review work and opening activities. And then we end with the story, which has worked out really well. And so the information that's provided in here as far as stories or lesson activities, the lesson content, that's something for you to review prior to delivering the lesson. Okay, so now you and I are going to go through these next two together. This is Beowulf, this is Angles, Saxons, Celts, and Danes. Oh, this is really nice. So again, some illust- oh, this is great. I was about to say you get some illustrations here to help you um, for your main lessons, but this is so brilliant. I love when sample main lesson pages are provided because you get a really good understanding of what to expect from your child. And this is just beautiful. You can see a simple illustration and more so you can see a simple narration too, which could have been dictation, narration, or copy work. You can see that they're using uh, cursive writing at this grade level and you can see that it's actually not a lot of content so these main lesson books are maybe 12 inches by 9 inches and they're showing the landscape format here i i used to use uh, the landscape format a little bit more when my children were younger and then we went to the portrait landscape which looks like this direction when my children were a little bit older and this is younger and older within elementary school so i would say about Fourth or fifth grade is when we started doing the portrait lens, uh, sorry, portrait orientation. And when my children were younger, we did landscape. Uh, here they're showing landscape. It's completely okay. Uh, I think this is probably easier for children this age because when they're writing, they're, the script, the font is quite large. They're still maybe using a color pencil or a large pencil. Uh, by this age, they're probably not using a a stick crayon, but it's possible that they're using more than just a fine tip pencil, depending on their dexterity and fine motor skills. And when they're writing, oftentimes, at least this is what I saw with my children, although by grade four, they were probably transitioning more into like smaller script. But I found that because their their letters, their, their font, their words were so, so much bigger, if you were trying to do that on a page like this, you would not be able to utilize the page as much because you would keep having to stop and go down to the next to the next line. But when you're in this orientation, you have a little bit more space to get some words in before you have to drop it down to the next line. So this is a this is a nice reminder that uh, the children might still be writing with quite large script. They might be writing with uh, one of the thicker Lyra color pencils. My children did that quite a lot. I'm not sure if that's something that's traditionally used in a Waldorf setting, in a school setting at this grade level. And you can see that there may be a couple of sentences, maybe three sentences at most, maybe four, maybe a, a, a whole paragraph. But you can see that as the children are getting older, they're moving from one sentence to maybe two sentences to maybe instead of copy work, maybe some dictation, and instead of dictation, maybe their own narration. And by this grade level, you can expect that their vocabulary and hopefully their spelling is enough to do some simple narration. But I found that my children would often choose more simple language because they knew how to spell those words rather than more complex language and vocabulary because they didn't know how to spell those words. But if you ask them to orally narrate 
the passage, they could use much more sophisticated language. And so sometimes I would write those things down so they could copy them, or I would write down my own narration that they could copy, or sometimes in the book, both copy work and narration are provided for you. So just a, a note on that. So this is going to include, it seems like a lot of the poems, maybe even um, a play, I think I saw in this one or in the other one. And again, this would be for, for you to pre-read so that you could deliver these lessons to your students. And then this is really nice. It gives you a bit of a lesson plan here on the side, which is so helpful so that you know what to prepare for when you're delivering your lessons. And once it, oh, really beautiful watercolors are included here. And then I, and then you have once again at the beginning of the book uh, additional sources that you might pick up although i found that when i've picked up additional resources to be honest they've really reduced and, and taken away rather from the main lesson block itself i find that almost always the main lesson books have enough information for you to do your lessons i usually get overzealous and purchase a lot of books or pick up extra books from the library and include a lot more resources than what's necessary. And upon reflection, because we've been homeschooling for about 20 years at this point, upon reflection, I feel like the times that our main lesson blocks went the best is when I had fewer additional resources. When our unit studies, however, went best is when I had a nice collection of resources. So it wouldn't necessarily include the main lesson book itself, but it included a nice assortment of resources from historical fiction to cookbooks to picture books to reference books those ones turned out really well okay let's move on to the last one Kelvala and this is a story or a poem rather that I knew nothing about and so I um, I can't tell you much about the content itself but let's go ahead and, and check out these beautiful illustrations and I'm assuming that the format for lessons lesson activities is going to be pretty similar so once again, some really beautiful illustrations. What I found with the illustrations sometimes is that the illustration itself was inspiration for you to then do an illustration that would match your child's age, development, and capabilities. So sometimes something like this that's quite small, your child certainly could do this, but I found that the more detail a, an illustration had the older my child had to be in order to mimic those examples or to copy those examples i found that the younger they were the larger the sheet of paper needed to be and the more broad strokes the illustration needed to be in order for my child to be able to do it with success uh, and here's like a great example of that. You can see a, a rainbow being formed here, but you can see that there's not a lot of description within the two illustrations or the, the paintings here of the two figures. And this is a really nice example that even this level of detail my children would struggle with, especially if your page was wet on wet and didn't have any time to dry. A little bit of drying is necessary in order to get these kinds of details, which means that you really have to walk your child through that process process because they're starting with a quite wet page to begin with doing a couple of layers and then you can see here that part of it dried enough to get more detail for the rainbow whereas this section here was either intentionally left this way or it was more wet and you can see that the colors kind of bled through a little bit more and my understanding would be that this would have to be a little bit more dry in order to get this kind of detail and also leaving blank spaces negative spaces is a little bit challenging for i think anyone but especially for children and so that would be something that you would need to walk through so if you ended up with just all red and all blue that would probably be a pretty good example of what a child could do and you can see some more illustrations here this would be again more detail then my children could achieve looking like this. They could achieve some detail, but not quite this much. But as the page dries, that's where you can lift more and more of the color. And then something like this, uh, you know, there are children who are definitely just naturally talented and skillful in this way. But something like this, again, would be a little bit more detailed than a grade four student could do in my experience with my children. Uh, but certainly there are children out there who absolutely can do this and adults as well. 
Okay, so these are, um, this one, oh, this is nice too. So you get another example of some main lesson book entries. And I really like the way they did this one here where you have the color kind of bleeding into the other page where they're writing their narration. I really love that look because it includes somewhat of a natural border around your text rather than doing a very squared off border and then having this be quite separate. And when we're doing the, when I used to do these in the past and I did not do this particular main lesson block, nor did I do this one. When we would do our borders, I would have my children do their borders and then their writing. They very rarely did a border that kind of blended in with the illustration. And I really, really like this idea. In fact, even with our illustrations, oftentimes I still had a separate border. Now a word on, on, um, borders what i find really helpful especially as the children get older and their script gets smaller it's really nice having a border because it sort of limits how much space you have to write on a page and especially since i prefer to use the larger form even larger than this nine inches by 12 inches because i like to use that format a little bit more often having that entire page for writing can be a little bit overwhelming but adding a border helps to make it smaller and also helps contain that writing a little bit easier because my my personal recommendation for my children my rule for my children is that they still need to fill the page with writing and not with like super large block writing in order just to fill the page but they do need to fill the page i mean if, if it's like maybe an inch or two from the bottom that's fine but they can't just write half the page or a third of the page they do need to fill the page with writing but my children are older and when they were younger and we were using this format of main lesson book we were often writing with a larger pencil or color pencil and we would just still be able to fill the page because their script was much larger okay let's um go back to the did i already share with you the front and the additional resources that are provided okay so there are a couple of resources here that are suggested and a lot of times i've noticed that the resources that are suggested are meant to inform you as the t teacher as the parent and sometimes that information isn't even being delivered to the student it's information that helps you have background to the stories that you are sharing which are usually included in the main lesson main lesson book or main lesson block and sometimes you'll find that the stories are included in a separate main lesson block uh, or rather i'm sorry a separate main lesson book but the stories and the additional content is usually always provided for you to do the lessons but what's also recommended is additional resources for you as a teacher to have the background and the context for these stories and to educate yourself and to really embody and own these stories. I hope that was helpful to you. I hope that you'll check out uh, the blog post that accompanies this video, which has more details for grade four and this curriculum as well. And if you wanna check out some of the other curriculum reviews, you can find that complete playlist in the description box below. And if you wanna see how we're homeschooling on a daily basis, you can find me on Instagram at Pepper and Pine.